right you are. Oops, I touched it. I'm just staring at my phone, waiting, waiting. I wish I could make that picture the video that came with that picture because those were the happiest bees i think i sat and watched them for 10 minutes okay according to my phone it is two o'clock so I'm going to go ahead and get us started again so that we can get through a whole host of really interesting topics during this afternoon session. Welcome back to the introduction to seed production modules, which are part of the Northeast Air funded grant, increasing capacity to produce high quality regional adapted seed to enhance Northeast biosecurity and diversify markets. Um, I am Crystal Stewart Cortens. I will be moderating this session and I'll have all of our um, wonderful mentors and speakers just give a very brief introduction to your of yourselves as you begin speaking about the first topic that you cover. That way we can make sure everybody who's joining us for the first time during this session knows who we are and what we're doing. Before we get started, um, we're going to have folks answering this question of what are your experiences with open pollinated seed? Um, because we'd like to just get a sense of, of how people are feeling about open pollinated seed, um, whether you've had really great experiences with it or you've had some more challenging experiences with it. And the goal is that we'll collect all of this information and uh, we'll use it throughout the entire set of workshops that we do after this, but we'll also try to touch on um, the aspects of your experience that might have something to do with seed production itself when we're going through a set of topics that come next. So just to give you a sense of, of how this is going to work, this next two hour session, um, we're going to be working from a round table format. Each of our speakers have um, some experiences that they'd like to talk about already but we're going to make sure that there's always time for um, some Q&A with each of the topics that we cover. Um, we're going to build a 10 minute or so break into the middle of this session so that everyone, our speakers especially, can get up, stretch, move around, um, grab that last cup of coffee of the day um, and come back refreshed. And then we'll end with another 15 minutes of, of Q&A. So I invite everyone to ask questions and share your experiences through the entire session. Um, unlike the last session, this one is full on participation. So we'll be keeping a close eye on the chat, looking for questions um, and looking for you to share experiences with each other. These are the topics that we as a planning group brainstormed to discuss today. We'll try to leave enough time that everyone can discuss other topics if there are things that you really want to cover during this time. Um, but this is just the things that we thought would be really interesting to discuss with you. So we'll be going through these in order, um, which allows us to keep all of our slides organized. And then we'll leave some time for cleanup Q&A. So we'll start off by talking about crop planning. Um, we'll talk about how you can do isolations on a diversified vegetable farm, which is a question many of us are asking as diversified vegetable farmers. Um, we'll talk about the season length for crops that are harvested when they're past the maturity that you would normally harvest them as vegetables. We'll talk about dual purpose crops, so crops that you can sell at market and that you can also harvest seed from. Um, the, the gains and losses that come with seed harvest timing, 
um, a little bit about disease um, and pests, and also about maintaining your crop parentage, so selections. Um, we'll talk about issues with dry crops in humid climates and how we're different from the West Coast seed producers and, and other regions throughout the world. Um, we'll talk about the horticultural and technical considerations of producing seed crops. And we'll talk a little bit about post-harvest handling and the equipment that you need. And just a reminder, as we get started, this is just an introduction. We are going to leave you wanting more, and we are very much looking forward to digging into these topics during that seven-week course that follows. So I'm going to stop sharing. And actually, I'm not going to stop sharing. I'll just go back to this slide. And I'll ask folks to drop into the chat um, what your experiences are with open pollinated seed, good, bad, indifferent. And we're not going to use poll everywhere because during the break, we learned that even though that's a really cool tool and it was really fun to see everybody's um, answers coming up on the screen, we're capped at 25 people with that tool. So that's what happened and we didn't know it until we used it. But if everybody wants to check out the chat box, we'll definitely see what people's experiences are there. Crystal. Oh, yes. Um, can I define what I mean by open pollinated? Yeah. So um, what we're talking about here are um, seeds that can be saved. So um, many times we'll think about open pollinated seeds originally as heirloom seeds, but um, as breeding has continued into the present day, um, we're now growing our modern heirlooms, which are these seeds that can be saved. Um, and those are open pollinated. Is that the simplest answer I can give? As opposed to hybrid seed, which cannot be saved. Or I might say you can be saved, except it doesn't necessarily doesn't come back true to type. Correct. So that so yes. that I think so sometimes we use the word open pollinated, but that word kind of evolved out of the construct of the word controlled pollination, meaning that we didn't start calling things open pollinated until we had something that was called a hybrid. So the word open pollinated was all seeds. Right. It was and then we could, and then we had something that was called hybrid, and that was what we called controlled pollination. So the idea of open pollination was the plants or the bees themselves are producing the seeds, rather than controlled pollination, which is generally and was and in many cases still as individuals rubbing flowers together to create your brassicas and tomatoes and pepper seeds. Thank you. That was a wonderful nugget, and I think this is the fourth. Heron Breenism that I'm writing down today. Individuals rubbing flowers together. That's that's what we're going to be doing in this course. I must be really boring for that to be a thing you're writing down. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just it's just the Breenisms that I'm writing down. There'll be a whole notebook of these by week seven. This is great. We've got lots of good experiences happening here in the chat. All right, I'm gonna invite people to keep sharing those in the chat um, and we'll be saving these again and collecting them and doing fun things with them. And some people have only experienced open pollinated. That's fun, I like it. Yeah, and, and I'll share that, that one of the reasons that I got interested in seed in the first place was trying to buy seed from a few really small companies and getting really diverse quality of seed and realizing like, wow, um, this is this is something that that um, could be worked on. <laughs> that, that yes, there's there's really different qualities and, and we need to be thinking about how to improve that. So it was a big eye opener for me when you've only ever seen hybrid seed that's been screened for, for quality. And it's like, oh, seed is seed. And then you realize it's not. This is great. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to start in on this list of topics and our grower roundtable. And I'll just remind everybody as we start with this to just give a brief intro again in case folks are joining us for the first time. So we'll start off talking about uh, crop planning uh, and how food crops differ from seed crops in food planning. And we'll kick that off with Dan 
is going to share a couple of slides with us about this topic. Hi, well, so I'm Dan Brisbois from Turnasol Cooperative Farm. Um, we're outside of Montreal and we're a, uh, we grow vegetables for a 500 member CSA and we also run a retail seed company and grow seed for it. So I will share that screen. Yeah. And so there's a lot you can say about crop planning. And um, I'm gonna kind of just go through some real basic stuff that uh, distinguishes seed and veg crop planting, just a few thoughts. Um, so one part of when you crop planting is when do you grow? When do you plant? And if you're growing vegetables, you're really worried about having a continuous supply of crop throughout the whole season. You're really interested in making sure your varieties have a range of days to maturity. And you're really looking at when to plant as a function of that. Um, and as a seed grower, you're not trying to maintain that constant supply over the season. What you're really trying to do is get a seed crop. And so that's often there are specific times that work better to, uh, to plant. And so, um, and these are the planting periods I've put down are my experience. And so we're zone five. Um, uh, and it might be different if you're a bit warmer than this, but there's sort of three main planting periods that we work with. So early May, we try to get any frost hardy annuals in. We try to get them in as early as possible so they have a nice season to get to grow to a large size before they're gonna bolt and, and, and set seed. Um, often if you plant too late, either things don't have time to flower or some things will flower, but they'll stay vegetative and not actually set seed. Um, and then if something's more frost, uh, can tolerate the frost, then, well, you, depending where you are, might maybe end May, mid-May might be good. But usually early June is when we'll plant those crops. Also having a warmer soil gives them a, a chance to, uh, to establish. And then biennials are something that can depend a lot on where you are and which one you're talking about. Uh, but often um, you want to start later in the season so that they're um, they're not too big going into the winter so that they don't have as much stuff that can rot or get damaged and just a little bit hard, hardier. So sort of mid late, mid July to late August is often a good time to plant biennials, but that can also depend if you're planting under tunnels or greenhouses. So that, that one's the, the broadest. Um, now in terms of how much to grow, um, if you're a veg grower and you're selling for market or CSAs, you know, you want to have enough, but you also got to be careful. You don't produce too much because that, you know, is, you have to weed and maintain everything. Um, and if so, if you don't have a market that can absorb it, growing too much uh, vegetables can have an, can be a problem. With seed, um, now, not to say you can't grow too much seed, it's definitely possible, but seed stores fairly well. So overproduction is as much of a problem. Um, and so you don't have to worry and often like we'll try to grow a two to three year supply at any one point. Um, so we're trying to produce more than we have. Uh, and so the math, you know, at a simple level, it's needs divided by yield equals the bed feet to plant, to plant as a typo there. But the, amount, the, long, the length of bed that you want to plant, if you know how many bed, pounds you need, you divide it by the pounds per bed feet. I have a spreadsheet here, a spreadsheet, if, if that's, that's my website, spreadsheet.farm slash FSA 057. It's a spreadsheet by, I posted a while ago that has different yields of different seed crops. If you go to that page, you can get it. There's, there's a, a prompt for a newsletter. You don't have to take it. It's just in the bottom. You can go for the spreadsheet. Um, so it gives you an idea about different seed yields. Um, now, those yields have a range of like low to, hev to heavy, and that just depends a lot based on variety. Um, and then also... If you don't harvest at the right time, if you wait a little bit, a lot of seed can shatter. Or if you harvest too early, there might not be enough seed matured. So there's a, a few things that go into it. If you're a new seed grower um, or you're new to a seed crop, you probably shouldn't be aiming for optimal yield. You're kind of, you're more about figuring, like learning about it than about getting the best thing. But once you've, you know, if, if that is part of a core part of your crop, uh, your, your system, then you're going to want to be uh, crop planning a little bit more accurately. And um, yeah, and then if you are trying to harvest vegetables and, and seeds from the same crop, I've loosely broken this down into three groups. So if you're dealing with leafy greens, you know, annuals or biannuals, often like lettuce or different brassica greens or kale or chard, often harvesting the greens won't impact the seed yield very much. So you can get a full salad green crop and you can probably get a full seed yield. If you're dealing with something that has fruit on it, such as tomatoes, squash, or beans, 
um, those crops usually need to be mature to have that seed. So if you're harvesting the fruit to sell it as a vegetable um, or to eat it, you won't be able to harvest it also as a seed. So you can't have your bean and seed it too, or something like that. Um, and, you know, um, and the place that has the biggest impact I find is with beans and peas uh, because they already don't produce tons per bed foot considering how much you use. Whereas like with tomatoes or even squash, you might be able to get a decent crop of both um, depending what your goals are. And then if you're using biennial roots, um, so in the first year is when you're producing the root, like a carrot or a beet or a turnip, you know, if you're a veg grower, this is actually the best place to a great synergy because you can grow, you know, a thousand, two thousand or 10,000 of these roots and then choose the best couple hundred. And that'll give you a chance to really have the best individual. So it's kind of stack well, um, the seed and the veg. Um, and my last slide is I do have a crop plan template that you can access here, spreadsheet.farm slash BCP, that's for better crop plan, it's short. And this has a, just a, a series of, I'm, I'm not going to go into it here because we don't have the time, but a series of columns that walk you through backwards from your needs to how much to your bed feed and then kind of your, your greenhouse trays and that kind of stuff. And it creates planting calendars using, using pivot tables. Um, this sheet is around vegetables, but I use it for seeds too. So um, those are, that's a, 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 a little bit of crop planning for seed growers. Thank you. That was very expeditious. Um, so, so one thing that came up was, um, can you actually explain a little bit more about what biennials are and how they work? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, um, Annuals is when you have a crop that you plant in one year and it goes to flower and set seeds in the same year. And then usually it'll die afterwards. And so that's an annual, a one-year cycle. A biannual is doing something like this, but over two years, two years. And so the first year you're gonna get usually a storage root produced, or sometimes it's a plant like a, well, so almost all roots are biennials. Um, and so the first year you, you get a, a storage vegetable and then you have to overwinter it somehow. And so if you're in a Northeastern climate, that often means taking it out of the ground and putting it in a cold room and then planting it again the next year. And then in the second year is when it'll go to flower, uh, produce seed and usually die. Um, so most storage roots are biennial. Radishes is one that you can usually get in an an, as an annual. Um, and then um, chard, kale, uh, most of the heading brassicas uh, are also uh, biennials. And then there are some crops that you can treat as an annual, or sometimes we'll call them a winter annual, um, which is something you'd plant in the fall, like a, like a Bresca Rapa, like a, like Mizuna or Rapini, you could grow in the fall. And depending on where you are, they'll overwinter uh, in the field and set seed the next year. Um, there's also um, perennials, which would be something that uh, will set seed for many years. Um, and, and it might not set seed in the first year, um, but most vegetable crops that you are saving seed from aren't perennial. That's kind of the exception. Um, it's a little crash course. Perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. Crash courses in everything. Yeah. I didn't see any other targeted questions about um, this topic. Did I miss any? Did anybody else see any? Or do any of our other presenters have anything that you would like to add before we move on to our next incredible crash course? Cool. All right. That was great, Dan. Thank you. I think that was a, a very comprehensive introduction and also very exciting. So next, we will move on to how to do isolations on a diversified farm. And I'll have Amira give a quick intro of herself while also pulling up those slides. Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Amira, I'm farmer for 15 years, uh, seed grower for five. Um, and I have uh, my own farm on, um, I lease land at an incubator in Pennsylvania. So uh, part of the reason I wanted to go over isolation distances with you is because um, as 
as someone who leases land at an, at an incubator, I have to share the same farm with multiple other people. There's, um, I think, you know, five, five of us um, and three, three other farms that are diversified vegetable farms. So it can be really tricky um, in the space, um, since I focus primarily on seed production, to do isolation distances successfully. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and give you a little quick uh, creative solutions pitch. All right. And here we go. Okay. All right. I hope everyone can see that. Looks good. Perfect. All right, great. So really quick, um, when I'm referring to isolation distances, um, I'm referring to the minimum distance that you need between crops of the same species in order to prevent crossing between different varieties. So if I have um, two tomatoes and they are, they are the same species, but we have different varieties here, maybe I've got, um, I grew this year purple calabash and plat de Haiti. And in order to make sure that those two didn't cross, I had to put some distance between them. And the amount of isolation distance that you give between crops is largely going to depend on how they are pollinated, whether they are self-pollinated, um, insect pollinated, uh, wind pollinated, or any combination of the three. Um, so the, the best way to maintain isolation is by distance. That's the most reliable method. It's the one that, uh, or it's it's not necessarily the most reliable, but it's the most common method. It's the simplest method. Um, and it's the one, if you you know read a book about seed saving, they're going to tell you what distance you need to use to isolate your crops. However, if you're not able to use distance as your primary mode of isolation, there are some other strategies. Um, using the landscape to your advantage can work pretty well. It kind of depends on what your topography looks like. But for example, if you have, um, if you're working with the wind pollinated crop like corn, um, and you have a sufficient wind buffer or some kind of a wind break um, in between uh, varieties, that may be enough to prevent cross pollination. Um, you know, if you live in a, a, a city and there's a lot of buildings surrounding your small garden, that may also be enough to um, increase your isolation without having to increase your distance. I will say though, uh, if you are growing seeds for a seed company, they may not want to go by your word that your windbreak is sufficient to isolate your corn. Um, so that that would that would really depend on who you're working with and if you could sufficiently prove that your, your stuff had not cross-pollinated. Um, another technique that I really want to emphasize, especially for people who are growing in community gardens or um, if you're in an area with a lot of other farmers, is communication and collaboration. The, the most effective um, strategy that I've been able to use in order to get the the largest number of my crops um, uh, to isolate is just by communicating with my neighbors and seeing if we coordinate something. Um, I ask them, for example, can I start your seeds for you? Can I um, can we all grow some of the same varieties? And I can start your seeds for you. And if you have if you really want to grow an eggplant, well, here's my suggestion. Here's my recommendation as a seed grower, and I'll grow out some starts for you. And and can that be the eggplant that you plant closest to my field, for example? Um, and and if you are working in a community garden, another great strategy is to team up with your community garden members and say, well, this year we're all going to grow the same. Um, the same squash and everybody's gonna grow this one squash and we're gonna you know, throw this big squash party and make a bunch of pies and save the seeds together. So that can be a really great way to, to, to get around the, those isolation distances. Another um, technique is isolation by timing. This is uh, most effective when you are in an area with a little bit of a, a longer season. Um, and the crop in question has a relatively short flowering season compared to their growing season. So what I mean by that would be um, in the 
opposite direction, like a pepper. It starts flowering and it starts fruiting and it's flowering and fruiting at the same time for the duration of the growing season. Um, but corn, for example, it flowers for a pretty short window, a few weeks, and then uh, it goes, um, those flowers die and it, it, it just starts producing the cob. So I use this technique to isolate my corn from my neighbors that um, do uh, GMO corn that's really short season. I can delay my planting by a month and still get a seed crop off of my corn. Um, and by that time, uh, we're, they're no longer flowering at the same time. So it's not really a worry. Isolation by timing is of course also really simple for biennial crops. Um, if you're working with a, um, uh, you know, say, say carrots, um, I'm a, and, and you can assume um, that none of your neighbors who are growing carrots are growing them for seed. It's not really a problem that they are, to, you have um, multiple varieties very close to each other because one will be in flower while the other is not in flower. All right. Um, Another way to maximize isolation is by using containment methods, which is pretty labor intensive. But this is also a technique that I have I relied on heavily um, last year. Um, so you can the you can contain just the blossoms um, in a technique called blossom bagging. You can see that picture down on the left. Um, and blossom bagging is easiest with crops that are self-pollinated or can be self-pollinated, um, like tomatoes or okra. And all you have to do is close the bag around the flower before that flower begins to open um, and mark which uh, mark the flowers that you bagged so that you know uh, when that fruit begins to develop that you can save seeds just from, from the plants that, that got bagged. Um, if you are working with a crop that is requires some kind of insect pollination, you can still do blossom bagging, but you're gonna have to go in and hand pollinate them, usually with a little like paintbrush or something like that. Um, and then there's also on a larger scale, caging. And basically you can enclose your plants so that they are not, you know, they're, they're not getting outside pollen. This doesn't really work with wind pollinated uh, plants. I'm not aware of any, fabric covers that would be impenetrable to the wind outside of, say, an enclosed greenhouse. Um, but it works really well for self-pollinated crops as well as for insect-pollinated crops. Um, so you can, um, it can be as simple as a couple of stakes and some insect netting or some row cover. Um, they, they, there are also um, companies where you can purchase custom-made uh, uh, barrier meshes that can be used to completely enclose your crops. Um, so last year, I was in a predicament. I had, um, I had talked to all my neighbors. We 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 figured it out which plants we were going to be coordinating, which plants they wouldn't be growing, and which you know the exchanges I would be doing um, with them, whether if it was a. Uh, seedling exchanges, or if I was growing a crop for their farm stand, we figured it out. And I had another neighbor um, who wasn't growing vegetables, um, who had this little side piece of land that they were they were willing to let me um, use for extra isolation of my cucurbits, uh, my, my, um, my melon and squash family plants. Um, and so I was excited about the separate piece of land. And then I went to break ground and later realized it was in a wetland zone. <laughs> Too late, did not do my homework on that on that site. And so we couldn't break ground there. Um, and so I had, you know, all these plants, they were really ready to plant in a couple of weeks. Um, they had already been seeded and I, they had to go in the ground. So what I did is I took a caterpillar tunnel and I covered it in row cover. And this is where I planted my watermelon um, this past season. Um, it, I used just like a, a AG-19 row cover. Um, and it, it fortunately, it didn't get too hot. It didn't get too hot under the row cover. Um, the, the watermelon were really happy under that dappled light. It wasn't, it wasn't a heavy shade. It was, it was actually really nice in there at all times. And when I needed extra, um, 
I never really needed extra ventilation. I kept it enclosed at all times, you know, to prevent the plants from um, getting pollinated and just kind of uh, used, um, used rocks along the edge to keep those edges down. And that worked pretty well. I had about 400 feet between me and the next closest watermelon grower um, and really you want to have, you know, 800 feet to, you know, ideally a half mile. So it really wasn't, I, it, was, it wasn't great. Um, I, my intention with this tunnel was to go in and hand pollinate uh, with a little paintbrush. Um, and then I quickly decided I, uh, I didn't really want to do that. It was a, uh, it was a lot of work. So I went and I bought some pollinators, some, some, um, some greenhouse bumblebees and you know, set it and forget it basically. And um, yeah, that worked pretty well for me. So that was some of, some of my ideas. Now, if anyone else has ideas, experiences with creative isolation, I open it up to my colleagues. Yeah, we've got a lot of great questions coming in, but before we do that, I definitely want to let everybody else from the panel chip in. I think those are great ideas. I love the collaboration and communication. That's really important. Um, I, like one of the things that I, I try to do the least amount of extra stuff possible. <laughs> like uh, at the beginning, when you're starting off, you might be building up a seed collection, or if you have a year where you lose something, you can try to do that. But I, I find it so much easier if I can figure out how to get isolate distance, um, isolation distance to work. Um, uh, it's often um, it's just often the easiest thing. So like, those are all good techniques, but they add work. <laughs> and, uh, but if you're in an urban context, or if there's a lot of neighbors, it does make it more challenging. Absolutely. Hey there, I could chime in on a few things, if that's okay. Um, I think the timing part is really key. And for any, folks have been talking about carrot in the chat, that if you're doing carrots, and you are selecting roots that you've grown the previous season and then you want to save them you do have to worry about the crossing with queen anne's lace but there's this timing element where if i plant those roots into a, a high tunnel or a greenhouse early they will do most of their flowering before the um, queen anne's lace starts to flower or even if i put them in a garden because those roots are fully established and huge they'll at least start to flower um, but quite a bit before the Queen Anne's lace starts to flower. And then basically I flag those, either those stems or I prune off the rest of the stems that might come forth. And I don't, you know, I just leave the prime, what they call the primary umbel. Um, one thing to remember about um, isolation distances is that <clears throat> the distance is dependent upon the type of pollinator. And what this means is, and also the size of a population. So if I have an acre of squash, but then about say, you know, a quarter mile down the road, someone else has two squash plants, like two buttercup squash plants in their garden. The bees are not gonna fly to that garden and then fly all the way over to my place. The bees directionally will go, if they're bumblebees are gonna hang out in that localized area. Um, and the pollen does not survive from one day to the other, but honeybees are going to go to the wherever they're going to go, then they're going to go back to the hive, and then some of them might go to my place. So there's there's a directional element, and that's where the quarter mile or half mile, you'll hear people say, oh, a half mile um, between this and this. And so folks have asked, what about flowers? And basically a half mile is the general, like, okay, if you have two varieties of sunflowers, you want at least a half mile between the two of those. Um, a lot of the isolation distances that you'll read in books are predicated upon seed being grown out west where there's no barriers. Where there's no trees, no water, nothing. It's just like basically flat ground and you'll see sunflowers a half mile away and another sunflower a half mile away. And in that case, there's almost no, no stuff for the pollinators to eat anyways. So they're drawn to a lot of those crops farther distances than they would be in the Northeast. So a lot of this is this quarter mile or half mile increment is somewhat predicated upon directionals and also those barriers that Amira was talking about. So there's, a, I would say just in terms of someone asking that question about flowers, is you want to say, okay, I would want to have say a half mile to a quarter mile between two varieties of cosmos. But again, like Amira said, it depends on whether that flower might be self-pollinating, meaning it produces seed without, without being pollinated. So learning the biology of that flower is part of that. Absolutely. 
Um, I want to make sure that that I touch in with Angie and Tina real quick to see if you have anything to add. I know we, we heard some really great stories as we were doing planning from Angela about um, neighbor relations, but I think Amira had also covered that quite well. So if you'd like to speak to it. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think it's really important that communication, that's the way I do it myself, is I communicate with local farmers because I'm surrounded by, uh, you know, commercial farmers that are providing their food for their uh, dairy farms and things like that for their corn and their soybeans and crop rotations. So, um, you know, a lot of these methods that I'm hearing that people are using are, are some of our traditional ways as well. There's, there's that, um, that similarity in the farming processes, you know, and again, it starts with those relationships. So one of the things that I do, like, it's kind of hard for me to describe exactly how I do it because it's all up in here and people keep telling me I should write it down. But, you know, I usually do between 10 and 11 varieties of corn each year. And we plant on about 13 to 15 acres. And that's all our, you know, corn, beans, squash. We also have a um, what I call a superfood garden where everything in there, you only need to eat a little to have a whole day's worth of vitamins. So. Um, but what I do to, to not really isolate them, I guess, I don't, that's not the word I would use, but just to avoid that cross pollination, I have the timing of each variety of corn exactly down to when I know it's going to pollinate. So that when this one's done, the next one is starting. And when the next one's starting, the other one's starting. And I do, I used to only do two plantings. So I would do one in May and then one in June. But now, because it's so cold, sometimes it even snows on Mother's Day, our planting season is moving back like a month in here in the Northeast. Like I know a lot of us are still planting things we normally didn't 10 years ago in July even. And it's lasting because we're still harvesting in December, which is odd. You know, people used to laugh at me from other places, other uh, Native people, because they'd be like, what are you doing, Ange, you know, in December? And I'm like picking beans braiding corn and they're like what it's too cold out and I said well I'm not up here anymore so we, we're still doing those things so that cooperation um, with nature is important as well and recognizing all those little details of, of pollination so um, you know just for us covering plants and you know I've even seen farmers that put uh, little brown bags over the tassels you know like that, that would be a taboo farming practice for us indigenous people. Um, just to let you know, it's because um, they're thought of like children, right? And we wouldn't do that same thing to our children. So it's really having that really close relationship and paying attention to all the aspects of that growing cycle. Um, and when it comes to our three sisters, which are corn, beans, and squash, um, they assist one another right so we don't always plant them in the same garden and I'll use crop rotation in order to rotate that around so that if any seeds have fallen into that garden the next year there will be beans there instead of uh, taking that opportunity that another variety of corn may have fallen into that into that soil and then you know uh, cross with whatever variety is going to be grown in there next we don't always do the same same one so it's kind of a little dance. I call it the seed dance because you have to know just which, when, and where, how to do it. And it takes time to learn that whole process. You know, um, it takes a lot of keeping track of and uh, paying attention to all the signs of nature. So that's really what we use as triggers for corn pollinating and when you're supposed to plant those foods. Um, I myself, well, we don't we don't have greenhouses. So everything that we plant on the Onondaga Nation farm is right into the ground. All of our seeds, we don't have starter plants. We don't have greenhouses. All of our foods get start from the ground to the table. So um, sometimes they take a little bit longer in that way, you know, to make it to the harvest. And it is a lot of um, a lot of hard work, but because we do hand planting, right? We don't use uh, farming equipment. We're doing traditional agriculture here. So it's human beings in the field, human beings pulling weeds, human beings leaving some of those weeds for pollinators 
or for root systems that can hold the soil so the plants don't fall over. There's different things like that. And it's a lot to, to learn, you know, it's something you learn over time and it's through practices. So I'm always learning something new from other people as well. If something didn't work for me, then I learn from others. And I've learned a lot of this uh, pollination stuff, how to prevent those um, cross pollinatings, even with sunflowers, even with um, all different things, you know, from elders all across Turtle Island that had this knowledge. And that's what's really important too, is, um, you know, communicating with a lot of these older farmers because they've seen the, the changes over these years throughout their time in the fields. And, and I think that's where we can get a lot of um, knowledge as well for it. That was an excellent reminder of why we have mentors for the seed course. <laughs> Thank you. Tina, did you have anything you wanted to add? You can say no, but if you do. No, I, I don't have anything to add. I think it's all very well said. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate that um, folks are keeping up with Q and A in the chat. Um, a lot of really detailed questions are being answered there. One of the general questions that's come up um, that I'd like to throw to the group is, um, what are the resources that you've learned from um, specifically related to isolation distances and population sizes? Um, how did you get that information aside from directly from farmers, which I agree with Angela, I feel like often it's passed directly from the mouth of a farmer into the ear of another, but are there resources that you found that that really worked for you in that regard? Um, I So I've got a few books I could point out. Um, one, there's definitely The Organic Seed Grower by John Navazio that has uh, that kind of information. Um, and there's Seed to Seed by Susan Ashworth is a great one. There's The Seed Garden. Um, and um, uh, there's also how to save your own seeds from Seeds of Diversity Canada. This one's really fun because it's extra small. <laughs> and um, so the information is packed. Um, but I think there's also, it's really good to know what is predominantly self-pollinating and predominantly cross-pollinating. And I think understanding that difference really lets you, it really changes the world <laughs> for, of seed saving. And like tomatoes, beans, um, lettuce, peas are some of the crops that are really, really self-pollinating. And you can often get away with like something like lettuce and you can get away with almost like five or 10 feet and see no cross-pollination. Whereas tomatoes 50 to 200 feet is probably good. And then, you know, there's only about a dozen crops that are predominantly self-pollinating of what we usually like think about as vegetables. Um, and almost everything else is, is cross-pollinating. And uh, I know that the, the number half miles come out a bit. I often think about 1,200 feet, 1,000 to 1,200 feet. There's a big difference in isolating stuff with possible exception of squash. Sometimes those squash can get cross-pollinated even at that, at that distance. But often in a Northeastern market garden context, I find 1,200 feet is usually good. And you know, if you have a lot of stuff in between, um, flowering or a greenhouse or other things, that'll make an impact. Perfect. Um, I, I would add, yeah, I think, you know, if, if there are um, growers in your area who have been saving seeds for a long time um, and they, and they're familiar with what's worked for them. Sometimes I, I talk to pepper growers and they use isolation distances that are far below what, you know, what the, what the books tell you and um, make me feel nervous, but they've, they've had success in year after year, uh, you know, they have been able to maintain the same varieties. Um, I, I, I like the seed garden as a, as a resource book as well. Um, but if a lot of times, if you talk to people who have been growing in your area for a very long time, they may have figured out um, some secrets of the trade. I will say also that how much you respect the traditional or the, you know, the sort of industry standard isolation distances really should depend on what your goals are um, as regards to seed saving. If you're seed saving for a company, they have their rules. And if you're on a contract, you follow them. Um, but if you are seed saving for almost any other reason, 
um, there's flexibility with your isolation distances. It really depends on what you're going for. If your goal is to produce seeds for your own sustenance, for your own um, friends and family, uh, isolation distances can be what you make them. And just understand anytime we grow seeds, we're involved in a breeding project. And the you know if we choose not to isolate our, our crops, well, maybe we won't have you know, the exact same variety, but it's still an open pollinated variety and it still has value in that following year. And you might, you might create something really interesting. Absolutely. So this is obviously a topic that we could spend a lot of time on and um, that we will spend a lot of time on in the course. Uh, and we'll dig into specific crops and all of their needs during that time. And your mentors will do exactly what we've been discussing, which is tell you what has worked for them. So have no fear that information will be um, really, really explored thoroughly. But I am going to move us on to our next topic before we take our little bio break. So um, Heron, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, and we'll pull up the cucumber slides for you to discuss um, season length for crops. Sure. Yeah. Hi, my name is Heron Breen. I live in central Maine, uh, St. Albans, Maine. And I've been farming and growing seed for about 18 years by myself or, you know, independent, not for someone else, with somebody else. Um, so my, some of my slides here are, are there's different things going on. Um, this is an example of an isolation distance. The inset on my left, a smaller picture, is actually a seed increase. So this is a little tiny patch of cucumber in a home garden uh, of a variety that's awesome that I only had a few seeds of. So that's a place where I start with something that's important that I want to work with in a basically a home garden setting to get a, so another batch of seed that I can increase. And then the larger field that you're looking at down near that tractor um, is that sort of narrow length of that row is all another batch of, of cucumber that's being grown. That is also actually a selection project. That's actually Market More 76 that I'm selecting. There's a strain that I discovered, which is really good, but I also discovered that there's plants that are more disease resistance, meaning that the disease resistance has not been selected for. So I was selecting the plants that were disease resistant from that population, but basically that's a seed production. These are in two different places. And with cucumber, again, they're bee pollinated and they need isolation distance between, I would say probably half a mile between that and any other cucumber crop. So. I'll talk a second about how I might mix that into a market farm, how I used to do it. Um, next slide. Next slide. Um, this is the difference between cucumbers that you can eat. Whoop, back one, there we go. Cucumbers that you can eat versus cucumbers you wanna use for seed. Um, so the one on the bottom, obviously the green one, that's a slicer that we would like to sell at the marketplace. And then the other two are kind of gradations towards what I'm looking for is a one that's gotten this. Uh, they have all cucumbers that have actually different colors. So when everyone says cucumber seed, it actually is by variety, meaning that they're going to have slightly different colors and slightly different characteristics by every single variety. Uh, in general, they can either become a rusty brown or a pale yellow when they're ready for seed, when they go by the things that off most in the market farm were culling out of the process. So how I used to do this when I produced seed was I would have three rows of cucumbers on six foot centers. And that I would, then I would have a break, a tractor row, and then another thing of cucumbers. And I would pick from the outside of the rows, but the inside of the rows that were vining into each other is where I would not pick and where the seed, you see the seed crop would go overripe. So I was able to pick some seed and harvest some stuff. Uh, next slide. And again, this is the gradation of another variety where all these are overripe, but I'm looking for most of the seed that's gonna be good is gonna come out of the two uh, bigger or paler ones versus the one that's kind of semi-green. Um, and it's like, as you grow seed, it's actually about getting to know the variety. So this is this is the market more 76. The previous slide was a different variety. So as I grow seed, I get to know what each one of them looks like in their step towards seed production. Next slide. Again, this is that same gradation. Next slide. 
And these are the fun things that you find, the twins. I love these, these are goofy. Cucumbers that have grown together that are fun. Um, and the great thing about cucumbers is I'm harvesting these overripe. So like Dan said, there's things that don't fit into the concept necessarily of I'm gonna get seed and a crop, like you're not gonna sell these, but I can sell other cucumbers from the same planting. Um, but what's great about it is I can also pick these and let them sit for a little bit or I harvest them all. I let these sit in the field till the very end of time as the whole season. These basically like will have a planting of cucumbers. The first planting of cucumbers is going to be the seed crop. And the ones that could be the later secessions are all for food. But I let that those yellow ones basically stay out there as long as the mice and deer. You will notice I had a Fort no, a Hort Nova netting over some of these you know, if, you know one of the picture you could see some of that in the foliage and that's to keep some of the deer even though i had a fence from jumping in and eating my overripe cucumbers so these overripe ones can kind of sit along and even though they've kind of gone funky they still are okay for seed why is that next slide so this is because the seeds that are inside are not ripe until they're overripe. And this is me just like cutting open a cucumber to check and see, is this the stage when they're ready? Me learning the crop. You wanna, next slide. And, and this basically as a knife, I'm gonna cut the seed in half and determine, is it hard? I just wanna be able to put pressure on it and see, has it gone from being soft and bendy to relatively stiff? And it had, uh, next slide. And the process of extracting cucumber seed is fermentation. So there's this little glob of gel that's actually a germination inhibitor around every cucumber seed. And to get this from the gooey overripe mess that you find inside the cucumber to the beautiful seeds that you pull out of every seed packet involves, for the most part, fermenting the seed. Next slide. And that involves scooping out those seeds on a small scale. And what I mean by a small scale is um, a production of seed that's somewhere between five and 20 pounds, maybe even five and 50 pounds. If you're really, uh, you know, an adventurous person, you pretty much scoop these out by hand. Um, and I scooped all of my cucumber seed by hand this year. There's a reason for that. I think it gives me higher quality seed. I don't love grinding things up. Um, it's just my own technique. I prefer to do it by hand. Doesn't take that long, and even by paying myself by the hour, I made money. Um, next slide. So I'm scooping these out. This is not like some kind of like detailed process, but that's what it looks like when the seeds out of it. Next slide. And you know, just basically, that's one cucumber's worth of seed in the bottom of a bucket. Next slide. And that's what happens when you get a full bucket full of cucumber seed. It's all gross and gooey uh, and fun. And I literally leave the rinds in the field to be turned in as compost. So they're part of the thing that gets returned to the soil is those rinds. You could also feed them to some animals where they love them and some animals, they give them diarrhea. Uh, next slide. So this is the fun part is that full bucket of seed actually gets divided into about a half bucket of seed per bucket um, because a full bucket is too deep for the seed to ferment on its own, I found at least. Um, there's a stirring process where I usually try to stir the seed twice, which basically is one every day for the first two days. And this is literally just an open bucket. Some people put cheesecloth or covers over them. You can do whatever you want. Um, those are all good things. Uh, these go into a sunroom or like the inside of a, a, a warm shed and they form this wonderful mold cap. And what happens is, is that locule of gel is broken and the seed that's good actually falls to the bottom and you end up using a wet washing process that extracts the awesomest seed from the seed that's light or secondary. So you're actually getting like a heavy water separation, and that gives you high germinating seed because those are the best seeds. Now you see a lot of seeds that you pour off. Uh, mistake in seed growing is sometimes to like hold on to every single precious seed. Yes, that's awesome. You can give some of those away, but it's a natural process for the plant to produce some seeds that are not fully formed and other seeds that are. That's just how nature works. So when I extract this and do this water washing process, I end up with, next slide, Uh, 
And this is me doing that process. Pretty simple. Next slide. Next slide, there we go. There's like basically a half bucket of cucumber seed from uh, concentrated down. Next slide. And you see that's the end result from a half bucket of cucumber seed. I pour it off and float it off through a couple of weeks, about, I don't know, five minutes for a bucket. And then I have this mess. So the, there's someone asked a question about dormancy. Um, a lot of cucurbit seeds, cucumbers and melons will have dormancy, dormancy and this is a little bit of a natural process. Um, and usually the, the seed itself breaks dormancy over the course of a, minute, a month or two. It'll actually germ better a month or two or three after extraction once it's been dried than immediately after extraction and drying. It's just a, a way of the seed kind of making sure that it doesn't germinate before the next season that the rains come or the fertility in the soil is correct. So it's doing that for its own good. And the next slide is drying of seeds. So this is taking place. Yes, you know, what? when the great thing about this is that I can extract that seed at the point where I want to at the very end of the season. And I actually take those bags of seed and I stick them in the fridge undried in a Ziploc bag completely sealed and they don't sprout. If I can let them sit in there for at least three weeks. And then when I get the chance, I extracted that seed back in early October or late September. I didn't dry it again until basically the end of October, early November is when that seed went on racks. And I can talk about racks and drying stuff another time. Thanks very much. I almost did it again. I almost restarted my computer. <laughs> That was great. Thank you for that whirlwind tour. Um, I think we were keeping up with the question, but did did folks have any other questions that you want to add in here? I'd like to ask Karen about yeah. that, taking the seed, the wet mm -hmm. seed and putting it in the fridge and then drying it later. Mm -hmm. Is that is that something like that's just because you don't have time to deal with it earlier? Um, and is it at all risky? Um, once it's been fermented and washed and goes into a clean bag, I basically have never seen an issue. Do you do or, this with any other crops? Yep, I do that with melon seed and watermelon seed. The fermentation process kills the bacteria on the outside of the seed. Hmm. So there's less bacteria and there's also this acetic surface that repels bacteria from growing. Now I'm not saying this, everyone needs to be careful about doing this. This isn't like, like hey, you should do this because I do it. I learned to do it because it worked. Um, I also, in small batches, I will take those scoops of seed. Those like, if hey, it's that little planting in my home garden and that cucumber, I'll scoop that gel, put it in a bag, put it in the fridge or in a vegetable cooler, and I'll get to fermenting it or extracting it when I get to it. So I often do that with melon seed because when you scoop out the inside of a melon, you can ferment that or you can put it in the fridge in a Ziploc bag and it will naturally turn into a little bit of a yellow goo in of itself. And then you can just wash that free. It's sort of sort of fermenting. And I've done a bunch of different germ tests and found that, guess what? All that fermenting is positive for the germ test and also the longevity of the seed. So there's a little bit of this space where things you learn when you're trying to run a farm and can't immediately process things. Right on. I feel like I shouldn't have learned that though, because now I have a great tool for procrastination. Procrastination <laughs> equals germination. You learned oh, it here. I did that with <laughs> eggplants this year. <laughs> I got overwhelmed yeah. and I just left them in a bag in the fridge and they turned to goo and they were fine. Because so that's what, so folks, that's what's going to happen to the seed if the fruit is on the ground and it's going to be overwintered in nature and then resprout in its environment. It's we're just emulating what that plant's gonna do anyway. So the answer is, do I do this with winter squash? So I extract winter squash through the winter. I just extracted a whole bunch of winter squash about a month ago. All that seed is still in the front of the fridge in selected bags. I just started drying it today. The answer is yes, but if you go too long, Maxima seed can do that. Machata seed has a lot more sugar and starch in the placenta and it'll sometimes like goo up. It'll get weird. 
if you leave it too long in those bags. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it turns into this dry rind that you're trying to pull seeds out of. So there's lots of techniques for doing this on the large scale. And sometimes that involves a machine. Uh, folks that are doing this on a large scale will often have a machine that they throw the fruits into and it chops it up and it basically separates the pulp from the seed. But that's, you know, a $10,000 to $40,000 machine, depending on where you buy it from. So there's needs for these at scale. But um, just for an example, you know, I got a pound of seed out of two buckets of squash, of two buckets of cucumbers. Um, and that was me pouring off a lot of light seed. I could have sold some of that seed. I actually had a second grade, but I would say I had basically a pound of seed per bucket and I cleaned it down to one pound, which seems like not a whole lot, but at $120 a pound, I feel okay about it. That's great. Any other thoughts from the rest of the panel about this topic? This is a fun one. Okay, and I think we got to Colin's questions. If we didn't, then pipe up. Um, yeah, seeds are forgiving. It's amazing. It makes you it makes you aware that things really want to live when you start working with seeds. All right, so we're going to take a pause. Um, I had originally said ten minutes, but based on the robust conversations that we're having, uh, are folks okay with taking a five minute break instead? Is that acceptable? Is that enough time to stretch? We're going to beat that three o'clock slump. We are going to go and do vigorous calisthenics, and then we're going to come back energized and do the thing. Okay, great. We'll see everybody back here at 3.05. See you in a minute. Great. I'm going to start bringing folks back. That was a fast three minutes. I ran up and down the stairs. Felt good. I hope other people did. Did a little dance by myself. Also good. 
And it looks like the winner of the conversation starters so far is the bag of goo. So thank you, Heron, for the bag of goo. What's up? So I want to make sure that my panel comes back before I start without them. People are returning. This is good. Thank you for coming back. I'm going to have so many bags of goo after this. Okay, that sounds like a quote. Yeah, yeah. You did have that entire bucket of goo. John Paul dumped it out. I was so pissed. <laughs> I had a 10 gallon tote of tomato goo, which I put outside the barn and my partner mistook for garbage. Also, the front of the barn is going to be full of tomatoes next year. Just going to mow tomatoes for the month. Should have labeled it. I should have. Precious goo. It's good goo, not bad goo. It was fully involved. It was pretty bad. I was pushing the limit of forgiveness. All right. Looks like folks are back. Very good. And we're just about on schedule. I think we're doing all right. So the next topic that we had on deck, um, I had Tina and Angie listed for discussing what we call the double duty crop. So these are the crops that are being used um, for more than just seed and, and how it is that we actually do that. So I will turn it over to you two to lead that discussion and we'll all jump in as needed. And now that Heron's thrown down the gauntlet of goo, <laughs> let's see what you got. <laughs> so I um I don't know if you're there, Angie, but I, I will let you jump in and contribute however you like. I did prepare like a mini presentation, um, but I do want to acknowledge that I am a humble seed grower, still learning a lot and that I'm open to suggestion and I'm open to any ideas that you guys have because I'm, I'm always open to suggestions and learning because everybody has something to offer. Everything, everyone has some value. So um, uh, I will, offer my suggestion also <laughs> for double duty, duty crops and um, what that means to me. Um, but yeah, if, if there's any new people here that weren't here this morning or in the beginning of this session, my name is Tina Square. I'm a Mohawk seed keeper from Akwazasne and I work for the Intertribal Agriculture Council or the IAC as the Northeast Region Technical Assistant Specialist. And my job is to serve tribal farmers in the Northeast, um, supporting them um, in their food sovereignty efforts or um, support them in their in, um, navigating USDA programming and so on. So um, that's part of my job. I'm like a living resource hub for tribal farmers. And um, I'm a partner in the Northeast SARE grant um, with this um, online seed production course and offering this course to tribal seed keepers. Um, and in, in this course, I, I've, I've been seeing a lot of um, things that connect and the things that are different and, and how we can all learn together. It's just a beautiful thing. But <clears throat> what I see, I've been seeing a lot of different uh, opinions as we're going just this morning, which is really interesting to me. But um, um, I can only speak in that my experience as as a indigenous seed grower and a indigenous you know person, 
And so, you know, I can just open it up, open up the doors and offer you what I have. So um, I don't know if you want to say anything at this point, Angie. Um, yeah, let me try to, I'm having technical vi with my video. Is that all right? Can you hear me fine though? We can hear you. No problem. That's okay. Great. Um, yeah, I, I feel like all of our foods are double duty, you know? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's really what they do is, you know, their food and it's, it's actually triple duty for us because part of that food is for the animals the forest animals to have some of the of the food from the garden and then there's food for the people and then there's seeds for the future for the future generations so every planting you're required to plant for those three groups and so it's kind of a triple duty i guess <laughs> so everything is in threes with haudenosaunee people that's our sacred number but anyways um you know when we're planting, one of the things I, I was listening to uh, one of the presenters earlier talk about, um, you know, when you plant all your seeds and then, you know, say something happens to the harvest and then you have to buy more seed. It's, it's a common Haudenosaunee philosophy to only plant half of what you ever have. So I think going forward in order to, um, to never put ourselves in that position. Like I love starting some of the old timers in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy will only give me three seeds to start something with, to see how invested I really am to make that turn into quartz and then bushels and other things like that. They'll only give me three. So you start with three and then there and there. And, and so each year, um, you know, I'll, I'll plant only half from that first three and then half again and half again in case, something should happen. Um, and it has happened, you know, it's disheartening when it happens, when a natural element takes, takes your seed away and your food for your people. It's a humbling experience, but it teaches perseverance. So um, that was just something I wanted to share, you know, from, from my, uh, my perspective. Perfect. Um, next slide, please. Um, I guess we should, yeah, um, put on a baseline on what, what double duty crops are um, and what, what I think double duty crops are, are crops that offer multiple uses during one growing season, which includes, you know, using it for food and then saving it for seed. And um, <clears throat> a lot of the varieties that we grow traditionally happen to be used in this way um, only because you know, it was our way of survival as indigenous people. Um, like like Angie had said, <clears throat> to reiterate what she said, we usually planted extra because we always kept in mind that we were a part of the ecosystem and we're a part of this whole and growing in a holistic way that we need to understand that there's going to be animals there and they come to the garden and they need to eat also and that um, there's going to be insects that come to the garden and they need to eat also and that our people need to eat also and so we planted um, multiple we would plant more than we needed because we're keeping in mind that, that ecosystem is there and that we're a part of it and so um, we would grow extra for 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 everything <clears throat> and that, um, if we did lose some crops you know we would have we would hopefully have enough you know for the next year to save for seed um, and what are some crops that are considered double duty crops and uh, the rest of the presentation I'm going to mention some crops that I believe in, in, in my experience I have grown for both food and seed. Um, but I do, I am going to add, add that note, you can add some things to the chat box if you have experience with crops that you've grown and save for seed and some things that maybe if, if you have experience that hasn't worked for both, that would be interesting to to know about, but um, yeah, add it to the chat box. Um, this picture here is a picture of wampum corn. Um, it's a dent variety of, of corn. I just thought I should mention that uh, really quickly. A lot of our traditional varieties of corn usually consist of dent corns, flower corns, or um, flint corns, which have a lot higher starch content. Um, next slide, please. Yes, um, 
Angie did mention this a little bit earlier. Uh, she mentioned the three sisters. Um, and if you don't know what the three sisters are, um, it's a term that comes from the um, native people that refers to the corn, beans, and squash. And the reason that we call it the three sisters is because um, you know they, they grow well together. They grow beneficially to one another. And um, you know, the, the beans will add nitrogen to the soil and the corn will grow up really tall and the beans, sometimes if they're pole beans, they'll grow, you know, they'll climb up the, the stalks of the corn, offer get more sunlight. And then the squash um, work on the ground is like a pest management or um, other things. So that, you know, they benefit each other in the way that they grow, but not only the way that they grow, but the way that they're eaten too. Um, if, if you eat them all together as one, <clears throat> which um, traditionally is what we would do because this was our main sustenance um the corn off, offers um a lot of nutrients and a lot of um starch and um the the squash um contains a lot of minerals and vitamins and antioxidants as well as the beans are you know considered a protein so when they're eating together it's a pretty well balanced diet and so that's why we called it the three sisters and in our language at least in the mohawk language we call them yonohekwa which translates to our sustainers you know, that's something that kept us alive for a really long time. And that's how they were able to earn this name as the, our sustainers. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it, um, this way of growing these two together was, was, is called today, is called companion planting. Cause you know, um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of companion planting, you know, they're, they're plants that get along together in the garden. So <laughs> um, these ones really especially get along together well, but um, um, I think it's interesting that there's a lot of new practices that are re-emerging with new names, such as like, you know, like regenerative agriculture and you know, conservation and things like that. But um, our, uh, traditionally the three sisters, they come from, you know, anything from these families, the three, the, the corn beans and squash, I would say are pretty good for using um, <clears throat> for double duty crops, such as, you know, the squash family come from cucurbit families, the beans are the legumes and uh, any type of variety of corn, I, I would say is, is pretty good for saving for both, as long as you have the space and isolation and the, um, yeah, as long as you're in a seed contract where it has standards about it. So um, Angie, do you have anything you would like to add about this before we go to the next slide? While we're, uh, okay, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. <laughs> I'm not very tech savvy. Um, yeah, the three sisters, just that they, uh, I like what you said about that because they do, um, it's not just symbolic. They're, um, they provide all of the nutrients that human beings need to survive. They're survival foods. And if you lived off those three things, you would have your body has everything it needs, even if there wasn't any um, other form of protein available. So I just wanted to add that in. The basis of our Haudenosaunee diet was mostly vegan, and um, any of the creatures from the sea or the forest were considered like a treat and a bonus. Yes, sorry, I was just answering a question real quick, but um, can you go on to the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> this is a picture that came from the, um, I believe this came from the Arthur C. Parker book, Uses, Maze Uses. Um, I can't remember the whole title, but um, this that was that book that I mentioned earlier, the Arthur C. Parker book, and he, he kind of talks about the different varieties or races of corn. Um, there's popcorn, flint corn, dense sweet flour, and grandfather corn or pod corn. Um, we do have um, species from each each type of corn that is traditional to our people that that we would use um, for our food. 
<clears throat> and um, we were able to save seed and use utilize for food from each each type of corn. Um, I have saved corn from sweet corn um, both both in um, one time, like in one growing season in my experience, but um, I'm not sure if anyone else has more experience in growing sweet corn because I haven't grown much of it, to be honest. Um, most of the corn that I grew was was our um, flower corn or flint corn or pod corn. I have um, one of the original varieties of our Haudenosaunee sweet corns was the black sweet corn. We also have red. I have so many, but um, the sweet corn takes a lot of tender care in order to put seed away. So that that's a real um, close one that you have to pay attention to and get it just right because um, if it becomes too dehydrated, then when you go to plant the seed again, even if you rehydrate it, the germ itself will um, will not survive. There needs to be at least a small amount of um, humidity left in the seed itself because there's not a lot of starch. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it's a sound that it makes. I'll have to teach it to you, Tina. You gotta hold it in your hand and give it a shake. And when it makes that certain sound, you know there's enough in there and not to dry it any more than that. So a lot of it is some, uh, even though Zoom is great, a lot of this stuff we will have to do hands on, you know. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Um, <clears throat> uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, someone mentioned this earlier. This is that Boston marrow. Well, that's one name for it, but um, we call it the Buffalo Creek squash. Or. Um, I've heard some debate about this. I don't know what you know about it, Angie, but I've heard um, some people call it Doshonwe, this this um, Buffalo Creek squash. But um, I heard some Seneca people, well, it derives from the Seneca people, their, their foods, um, something that they would grow. And um, when I've heard this Seneca name given to Seneca people, they kind of laughed and like, that's not the name of it. <laughs> But uh, I don't really know, you know, uh, that's what happens with a lot of our varieties is, um, you know, our, the specific names that we would have for them are, are um, kind of get lost in translation or, to, or they get lost and um, sometimes they'll have a couple of different names for one variety because we're not sure exactly where it originates from. Like, um, I know our Seneca, um, the pigeon pigeon egg, I think it's called Angie. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but that always gets mixed up with um, another variety of bean. But you know that it happens a lot with our, our traditional varieties of seeds. But these are are some that we would save for both double duty crops. Um, Yeah, I liked hearing the um, the methodology of saving any type of squash seeds, because what we do is we um, we let those squash, like everything we do, we pick it, we pick it when it's green and ready. So we pick corn when it's green and ready, and we pick um, beans two times, so they'll reproduce and create more, and each time they're stronger, and then the third time the beans blossom, we leave those for seed. So with the squash, because they're winter squash, um, we'll kind of do an assessment of the field and take two thirds of that. And the last third will be for seed. So that's how we do the double duty. But we let those get as rotten as possible. And then we just step on them when they are just so mushy and we scoop the seeds out. And if you compare the seeds like that from when say you're opening it to cook it at harvest time, the seeds are triple the size. So there's more nutrients inside the seed and they got a better chance at survival. And then when you plant them again, the following year, you get larger fruit by doing that. So I like hearing that others are, are doing that as well. Oops. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, this is just another, um, just another, Reminder that we can use beans for <laughs> double duty crops. I added these photos because this is when I was like very in the very beginning. I had picked my beans in that really small garden that I grew at home. Um, 
I had several different varieties um, that I was trying to save from seed. And it's kind of a reminder of when I was starting small. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of variety. I didn't have a lot of um, seed. So I whatever I grew, I had to save for seed. And it was almost like I had to grow it and do it really well in order to be able to eat it in the next year or the next two years or sometimes longer. I was trying to get enough stock where I could use this seed for food or use this crop for food. So um, um, beans are always great to save for seed. You can always, like Angie said, you can take two or three times in one season and the last the last crop that you, you would pick would you use for seed. Um, but beans are, are super great. I just love beans. So um, they're so beautiful and, and so interesting to grow, I think. Anyways, um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Angie, the crazy bean lady. Yeah, I really got into beans. <laughs> and then I realized, I don't know if the people on this call know, but we have a seed collection that has um, up to three to 4,000 varieties of heirloom corn, indigenous varieties of corn, and maybe five or 600 varieties of beans. I haven't got to the squash yet, so I don't know how many is there, but um, I try to do like 32 varieties of corn, of at least, at least 30 varieties of beans. And they're like, um, they're like jewels. So in order to encourage people to plant, I bought these boxes that they're, they're really meant for like beads or, or something like that. But instead of beads, I put seeds in them and they have glass covers. And just letting people have that tactile sensation of picking them up and looking at all their bright colors and all that other stuff. Um, it's really encouraged people to start growing because if you're, a, if you're just starting out growing, beans is the plant you should start with because they're a little bit easier to tend they're a little bit easier to harvest and they're pretty resilient, you know? Sometimes people start with corn and then they have a crop failure and then they're discouraged. They don't wanna plant anymore. But um, I felt like we're forgetting about our third sister, the squash. And she's kind of the forgotten sister because everybody likes the beauty of the corn and the beans. And I think it was 2021, right, right after the pandemic started. I decided to plant 5,000 squash plants thinking all kinds of people would want to garden during the pandemic and help <laughs> out, but that didn't happen. And then I assumed that about half of that would go to squash bugs, but it didn't happen. And we had like five thousands and thousands, 5,000 squash plants. Plus it was crazy. But in the long run, um, we brought a lot of varieties back. And so it's really important. I think this whole, Everything that we're doing now in regards to the seed is so important that it's kind of like things just get, they fall in your lap. You'll start farming and you'll think you have one path. You know, like I always thought corn was my path and then I fell in love with all these beans. And then after I was doing those two things, I felt guilty that I wasn't paying attention to that third thing, the third sister. And, and so now I'm actually able to recognize squash seeds by looking at them. That's a difficult task. You know, if somebody hands you a bunch of different things, I can tell if it's a cucumber or a melon or what it is, you know, or if it's a, in the pumpkin family. And, and so, you know, we all grow as, as seed carriers and we all learn different lessons and sometimes you'll, you'll get pulled into another path. So um, I think that's gonna be part of what will happen with this course. We'll see which path we get taken on. Yeah, I totally agree. <clears throat> Um, can you go on to the next slide, please? Oh, um, yeah, that's, <clears throat> this is um, the, uh, I forgot what it's called, Onondaga, Onondaga sunflowers. This is something I grew a few years ago. Um, this is another seed variety that um, if, if I go to Onondaga, they'll call it the Seneca sunflower. And then if I go to Seneca's, they'll call it the Onondaga sunflowers. <laughs> but um, it's a pretty beautiful variety of sunflowers that we have. Um, this is something that you can grow. This has multiple uses. You know, you can see the pollinators obviously on, on the flower and um, you could save it for 
seed and for food um in my experience but if some people have struggled with that i would like to hear about your experiences um but yeah I, uh, just um I don't know, Angie, if you have any more experience with sunflowers, it's like, I mostly just groom for for the pollinators and then I would save seeds here and there, but um, I always felt like there was such an abundance. I never really uh, focused too much on the sunflowers. Well, it, the sunflowers are a big part of our diet as well. And they were actually the first plant, you know, before the, they represent the sun, the sunlight. And um, they were the, even before sun, um, corn beans and squash. So the sunflowers can be eaten in so many ways, you know, like the heads can be um, when they're green before the seeds are hard, you can eat them as like a sauteed, almost like a mushroom or something like that. The petals are edible. Um, a lot of us make sunflower jelly or jam with the, with the petals in it. Um, there's so much you can make. The roots, you can eat the roots and the, you can make oil from the seeds just by pounding it in a corn pounder. So sometimes we'll make sunflower milk. You can make milk from it, or you can even make um, oil, skimming the oil off the top or pressing it, pressing the seeds. So there's there's so many ways you can do it. Um, I don't know if anybody on this call is aware, but those plants grow, I had one grow 23 feet. I had a 23 foot sunflower. <laughs> when we had the World Lacrosse Games here in Onondaga, I wanted, the visitors to see something spectacular. So I planted a whole bunch, hundreds of them um, right on the main road of the Onondaga nation so that when the visitors drove by, they would get to see it. And people from all over central New York were stopping to take photographs of it. Cause they're like, are those real? They were taller than the garage that was right next to them. And they were just so big. And I feel like uh, sunflowers are representative of all of us farmers because they grow and they're bright and they're so excited. And then when they get like close to the harvest time and they're just heavy with seeds and, and by then we're all feeling the same way, they just kind of slump over and they look exhausted. And that's how we all feel <laughs> towards the harvest time. We're all getting so tired of tending our gardens. And then, you know, then out comes the seeds and you have that joy again. So every time I see them, you know, uh, puff over like that I'm like oh my gosh I feel that same way I can feel you sister so yeah I, I love I have to plant those every year and uh just a little side story during the pandemic when I planted those what was really neat is at the very bottom of all those plants the natural wild sunflowers showed up they just grew along the edge in the weeds on the edge of the garden like it was almost like visitors like they came to see these great big things. And then there was natural ones, the little ones that are close to the ground were just showed up in the grass field. And it was, and I left them there because I didn't want, I couldn't bring myself to cut the grass. So I just let them grow. But that was pretty neat. That is pretty neat. <clears throat> uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, and this is just a reminder to everyone that we're all just learning. <laughs> Um, I just posted this on Facebook the other day. I had to share it because there's no guarding mistakes, only experiments, and then we're all learning and that we all have something to teach one another. And also that if unless you're growing zucchini plants and there's too many zucchini plants, then that's the mistake. But that's the only problem. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so is, if there's anything you guys want to add to um, even some input. Um, so I'm totally open to it. Um, so to retrack on what we were talking about um, for double duty crops, I would suggest um, plants that come from the cucurbit family or <clears throat> the legume family or um, different types of corn, I would suggest for double duty, um, but I'm totally open for other options. We've tried so sunflower seeds, um, some wild plants too. Um, I don't know if I'm missing anything, Angie, but uh... no, I think I think it's really important because seeds are going to have like you I heard you mention earlier, sometimes it takes me a couple of years to actually to be able to taste one of the foods. You know, I'll have to grow it long enough in order to have seeds first before I'll actually start eating it, you know, so that I can preserve every seed possible. And um, 
and it's kind of rewarding that way, you know, when you finally get to eat it. So there's certain beans that I grew last year that I finally will get to eat this year in 2023. Can't wait. You know, that took me a long time to get to. And I've tried a lot of different, um, you know, other things that are double duty that I, from, you know, uh, different farmers, things that were not our, our natural um, indigenous foods, but things I, I like to eat, you know, like different forms of kale and Swiss chard and real healthy things. We started the uh, superfood garden with, I love beets and, you know, all those different things that we don't normally grow in our traditional gardens, but our elders love it and our community loves it. And now we have seeds to share. So now everybody's growing it themselves. And that's the ultimate goal is to make everybody else have uh, seed access and then have that same rewarding experience that we're all sharing. So yeah, there's definitely no mistakes. There is experiments and there's lessons to be learned, you know? Definitely, in our indigenous perspective, we did we do have a different perspective that is like, we would save as much as possible. We're in like a commercial seed production kind of aspect. They would be a lot more selective with your seed. Um, but but still, I um I guess it just opens the opportunity where you you know it, opportunity to explore and to give you that courage to to try it try something new because you know indigenous people didn't have that those parameters back then <laughs> and we've we've done a lot of different things that probably see people would be like what are you doing <laughs> but this is the way that's worked for us and so. Um, that's just a note that I'd like to end on. I know we're probably going to be running out of time real soon, but um, thank you for allowing us to to share this, and um, I hope I hope it was helpful. That was great. Thank you. Um, and I was really glad that that you talked about um, briefly. I'm sure it's different for every single crop, and that's one of the things we'll dig into with the, the individual crops. But it was nice to hear about when to harvest the seed from a crop that you're also using as food, the timing of that. That was really interesting. Um, so that answered my personal question. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm curious if any of our other presenters wanted to jump in before we move on to the next topic, or if we're good. Wonderful, all right. So I, I want to do a little bit of shuffling because not surprisingly, we're, we're digging deeper into certain topics than um, I had a lot of time for, which is totally fine. Um, I'm making the executive decision to not talk about um, diseases on seed, but I am going to post in the chat a resource just listing um, some of the diseases that do run on seed. Um, during the seed course, we will not avoid this topic because it's important but for today i think we can we can skip that in order to um have the panel talk about some of the more um interesting and timely topics for today i'm also wondering um we had the gain and loss of, of seed harvest timing listed as one of our topics i was wondering if we could scratch that in favor of focusing on the dry crops issues um, horticultural and technical considerations and then post-harvest handling. Is that okay with folks? Was anybody just dying to hit that seed harvest timing one? Okay. All right. I'm I'm crossing those two off. Sorry, diseases. Um, so then we'll we'll skip ahead to the dry crops issues and humid climates, which was one of the topics that everyone was listed as an expert on since we all live in the super moist climate of the Northeast. So whoever wants to jump in on that topic, uh, please feel free to do so. I can jump in, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, well, there's, you know, seeds, I think where I start with there's seeds come, you know, either there's naked seeds and there's seeds in pods. Uh, so if you think about a coriander seed um, or a dill seed, it's just sitting there naked on the outside of the plant. Um, if you think about a, a bean pod um, or a brassica, like seed pod or silica, um, those are protected seeds. So um, 
one of the challenges with, uh, you know, just being a vegetable grower in general is you have to deal with the humid climate that spreads a lot of diseases. And that extends your, when you're going to be growing a seed crop that even goes further, uh, the, the, um, the period you have to protect against. And so a lot of stuff with pods, um, like beans do fantastic here. And I mean, they've evolved here too. So that's something that does well in a, in, a, in a wet climate because of that pod. Sometimes if you're too dense, that can add extra challenges. Um, but something like uh, lettuce or the, the beet family, the quinopods, uh, the umble family, um, with the carrots, uh, those are crops that it's, it's a bigger challenge uh, to, to get, you know, you have different you, you, disease challenges. And then also sometimes if it's really wet, especially if the, the things fall over and are in contact with surface, uh, like of, of leaves or stuff, you start to get germination issues too, um, if the seed is, is, is exposed. Um, so we, we actually grow a fair amount of stuff in greenhouses. And maybe I could share a slides that I was gonna do in the next section, but I could just share them right now because they're of growing in greenhouses and just show what that looks like uh, for us. Um, so there are crops that we're going to grow in greenhouse. So here, this is this is a greenhouse, and we have onions that were planted maybe end of March, early April in the ground here. So those are crops that uh, disease can easily spread through onions in the if they're not covered. Um, on the left, there is some red Russian kale that's there, and the only reason it's under cover is because we overwintered it there, and I didn't want to transplant it. Um, so you can see the onions coming up. Um, in the middle of the of the bed, we have some cilantro and dill, and this is actually piggybacking on sort of double duty crops, uh, not intentionally, but it's true. So this was all, these are five rows quite densely seeded that were harvested for our early CSA, and then um, they go to flower. And I mean, you could grow them outdoors also, but um, uh, in this case, I'm growing them indoors because they were already there for the CSA. Um, and then this is actually what, this is, this is a, a 70 feet of cilantro and dill. And this is what we got out of 70 feet of cilantro until it hasn't been cleaned down yet, but it's, it's there. And then this is this is what we I really like with um, is uh, lettuce undercover. Uh, we get much better yields than if we were uh, in the field. Um, so those are I, mean, I don't know if that's quite enough to say about it, but those are some of the things that um, you know, we can be really reliable with beans, peas, and brassicas, but almost a lot of other, and, and a lot of flowers, but a lot of other dry seeded crops can be more finicky um, uh, in our climate. Those are great photos. Thank you. Um, I see you unmuted, Amira. Can I, can I throw one question that's really specifically related to this in before? Yeah. So, so somebody was asking um, if the higher heat in the greenhouse can affect seed quality. Oh, and you're muted. <laughs> I had some really great wisdom nugget I started off with. Um, but um, um, yeah, it can. So it's important to have ventilation uh, that's 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 going through. And, some, and you know, something like lettuce seed, if, um, so I'm thinking about in, in, in Celsius, if you get into the, like into the 30s, so that's like, I guess, high 80s, low, low 90s, that can affect, that can create dor dormancy issues. Um, so that is, that is a challenge, um, but good ventilation can help out. Perfect. Thanks. Amira, I'll toss it back to you. Sure. I was just going to add just a couple of additional tips um, to address the humidity and also the rain. We we had a, um, a drought period uh, last year and following the drought period, we actually had a, a huge amount of rain. Um, and that became, um, that led to a lot of frantic harvest days for me trying to beat the rain. Um, and so one just really simple tip um, to add is I, I will often, if I'm expecting there to be a period of, you know, you know, lots of rain um, or rain followed by, you know, a lot of humidity where there's a the risk of, um, you know, diseases and and um, damage due to um, to mold and, and to other um, problems like that then I'll usually harvest early. Anything that is in that, uh, there's like a, a, a stage of ripening. I don't know if someone else wants to comment with more details, but there's a stage of ripening where um, the, the ripening, the uh, drying process has already begun and the plant is kind of, um, 
you know, taking what remains, uh, remaining energy from the, the plant to those seeds, and it's already begun the process of drying. And it is better to let the plant dry down, the, the, the pod or the, the seed dry down completely on the plant. Um, however, if, if it, there's a stage at which you can harvest it a little bit early and then set it out to dry um, off of the plant. And I, I've had quite high germination even doing that with a lot of things that I harvest early and I will lay them out in the um, greenhouse uh, with row cover underneath and then again on the top and I'll run some fans and um, just sort of dry everything down um, off of the plant, you know, if I'm expecting a lot of a lot of rain. Um, and then also just making sure that everything is fully dry. If, if you're working with something that, you know, has a pod, making sure that it's fully dry before you begin processing it is helpful. Um, can I just, well, I th I'll let Heron go. Go ahead, Dan. Don't finish your thought. Well, I was just going to say... Um, uh, I completely forgot that. I'm, I'm glad Amira brought it up. Um, and we'll actually also harvest whole plants, not just like the, the seed, but we'll harvest whole plants, brassica plants or flower plants. Some cut flowers really don't like to be harvested in advance, but a lot of stuff we'll, we'll harvest in advance and uh, the whole plant and bring it to the greenhouse and spread it out on tarps. And um, the greener it is, the more important it is to flip it almost daily or maybe even twice daily because it can compost. But, that, uh, but a lot of stuff will keep maturing indoors. And that's something that we also do to beat the frost. There's always a period near third week of June for us, not June, third week of September for us, where there's frost warnings and we might bring in a lot of stuff, even like whole bean plants with a lot of really green pods we'll bring in. Uh, and um, it's amazing what uh, what they'll do. Uh, yeah, I wanted to just chime in about this. Um, I grow beet seed and leek seed and and uh, onion seed and a lot of other fun things and i don't put anything in a tunnel so everything is outside <clears throat> i actually don't use greenhouses at all in my actual uh, field propagation everything if i have seedlings i'll use it but obviously that's not um and there's a tradition of things like turnips and rutabagas being crops in the northeast that people are saving for seed as heirlooms um, and many of those are adapted to overwintering and then planting super early. So the key is planting them super early, getting them in the ground, basically when you'd put your peas in the ground, getting those roots in the ground early so they can throw up a seed stock. Um, the other key of this is making sure that the soil that they go into in that second year is not super rich in nitrogen because they'll spend a whole bunch of time putting on a seed stock or leaves and they will not put as much energy towards getting towards their seed stage. So when we do biennials, at least how my tradition has been is that that uh, will actually follow a heavy feeder crop. So those roots will go into a crop like, um, like a corn or might follow something like uh, a grain that hasn't been fertilized so that that piece of the ground is actually kind of low fertility and that's the spot that the roots will get replanted in, whether that's a leek or an onion. And I use wide spacing. So you may see uh, a row of turnips and they will be planted two feet apart or sometimes three feet apart between each other in blocks. And that way there's a huge amount of airflow. Those plants will sometimes throw up a seed stock that's six or eight feet tall. And the same thing is depends on the variety of, when you say like it's hard to grow X in the Northeast, there's also varieties that are bred to be here. So there's some folks that have bred beets for the Northeast um, back in the day. And those varieties seem to do okay for seed here, where I may pick another variety and discover that it doesn't do well for seed here. So it's gonna be somewhat predicated by the variety. Um, I, I'm not gonna necessarily, so that, that's an element to remember is like spacing, fertility, and then Dan and Mira both, but like the idea of keeping these things off the ground, often these are trellised or not trellised, but are uh, staked. And then there's a wire running down to keep those stocks up from flopping over. Um, and like Dan and Amir both said, there's different stages where you can either be harvesting dry umbels or dry pods or pulling whole plants. Um, I think that, you know, when we think about biennials, it's, it's important. There's another step to this where I learned that people were kind of using upland well-drained soils for that. In other words, like as if you're on a you have a field that's on a slope or that's where you would plant your second year biennials because the airflow was 
draining rather than a lower spot, which might have more humidity and dew. So people were both working with their landscape to figure out which fields that would be good to go on. In Maine, and I'm sure other locations have the same issue or same benefit, um, we have a coastal climate where it has a dew, um, but there's almost no rain. So like Deer Isle um, Peninsula has like very dry during the summertime. And so a lot of those island communities have a history of growing brassicas, um, turnips, rutabagas, even kale, radishes, um, and cabbages um, for seed because they don't have as much rain. So some of this is just like experimenting, playing with it, understanding what you're dealing with. And, and that I think a lot of that soil and where we're planting heavy soil versus lighter soil, fertile soil versus well-drained soil has some impact upon when those seeds ripen. So I'd just like to notice that um, this topic very conveniently rolls itself into the next two topics and we're, we're starting to mix them naturally, but I'm going to invite our speakers to mix them intentionally. Um, and those two topics are thinking about the horticultural and technical considerations. So things like the troublesome and spacing that you were just mentioning, and then also thinking about post-harvest handling. And I want to make sure that we leave time for Amira to speak to her really cool drying uh trailer um, as, as one of the the ways that we're overcoming our moist environment we like to say that damp environment i don't know what the right word is but yeah I'll, I'll just invite all of our our speakers to comment on an expansion of those two topics um i could jump in and then sides share the remaining slides i have yeah. um and maybe I would just go back and show a little bit what trellising can look like. So here uh, with these uh, onions, we have just rebar stakes and it's a, a line of Hort Nova just to keep the stems uh, going up straight. Um, on the left, there's some rebar and we've done lines of, of, of string just on the side of the, of the kale to keep it from flopping over. Um, if in the field, I don't usually use stakes for brassicas, but in a tighter space, it makes a big difference. So that's just two things on, on trellising. Um, I'm, so here's some slides about pepper seeds. And you, know, you, you can easily cut a pepper seed open harvest the flesh and eat it, make a sauce or something with it and get the seeds. But um, this is the, the millet wet seed extractor I wanted to just share. Um, and so this is, we, we use this for tomatoes and peppers, especially a little bit eggplants, but in that case, we'll cut the extra part that doesn't have seeds off it. And you put the seed in the top and there's a, I don't have a picture for it, but it gets, it gets like grated up or crunched up uh, in that red part. And then the seed and flesh come out on the top and this shakes and it separates a stream of water and seeds on the bottom and all the other stuff on the top. And this is, I guess, theoretically, you could do something to eat with those, but I don't know that I would. Um, and then you have a bin of seed and, um, and, uh, and juice. And generally we'll pour off whatever's floating and keep the bottom and then collect it on a, in a colander. And so one thing I would point out is you know, like I'll be talking about seed economics tomorrow. So if you're thinking about if you're a contract grower or you're growing seed for sale, you can be very profitable harvesting, uh, cleaning tomatoes or peppers, even with manual tools. Um, and that's not why it wasn't to be more profitable. We did this. It was just we had minimum. We couldn't. We didn't have the time anymore when we started having really big lots. It would just take us forever to get through a lot, even though there was a profitable use of the time. And so we moved to this, and we're at least at least five times faster using this than. Um, than what we were doing with other stuff. And the other uh, slides I have are about saving some brassica seeds. Um, so there's some flowers on the right. Um, so these are the brass, so th th this is the kale, red Russian kale I just showed another slide of. And um, this is something we'd be good doing this year. So BCS with a sickle bar mower and just mowing them, knocking them down. And you can see behind, we're actually throwing them on tarps. And um, so we have individual tarps that are about 10 or 15 foot long and we'll pile them with, um, with uh, the brassicas. And then we'll usually, unless it's really, really dry, we'll usually bring them into a greenhouse and put them on the benches to dry. Or in this case, because it's already in the greenhouse, we kind of leave them in that spot and we let them sit down till they're nice and crisp. And then on a, on a, on a dry day, um, we'll take the tarps out and then we'll stomp them by foot. And, um, and then 
we'll just gather this stuff up. And that, so that's a, I don't have a better shot of it, but it's a, a piece of hardware cloth that's in a wooden frame that we made, same size as the bin, and then just process it through to take the, the pods out and get the seed. And then we can winnow, the, winnow it, maybe use some other screens to get it cleaned more. Um, but those are just some, uh, uh, yeah, so there's just a little bit of technical seed saving there. Great photos, thank you. Did that inspire any other thoughts from the rest of our group aside from I, I saw I saw Amira looking at that piece of equipment. I saw you. <laughs> I was too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I might I might jump in and just say that just to follow up one thing about like we're talking about this drying of these things and getting them harvested quickly. That's all about diseases. So this also dovetails into this other thing that we skipped, which is basically how and why we do these things is to kind of make sure that the seed is good quality and isn't moldy and doesn't get diseases. So when I mentioned planting biennials into a grain, previous grain crop, it's because the grain crop breaks uh, a cycle of soil borne disease potential in the soil for that following brassica crop. Um, I've used a plenum system for some small lot bat batch drying, which is like cucurbits, uh, tomatoes, pepper seed, et cetera. And basically these are screens that are fairly solid and they're stackable. And there's a fan underneath and there's a, two fans above basically. And I'm forcing air through a stack of screens. And basically I can dry a batch of like that cucumber seed was dry in, I don't know, 48 hours just from and the great thing about the screens is because they're stackable there's a top and there's solid sides so no mice can get in and they're all they're all cocked so there's cocking so seeds aren't going to get in or out or fly through or whatever so they're all in this compressed block and that's a way where creating a plenum is a way where i can dry a whole bunch of different batches of seed or types of seed all at once um, really quickly and um and that's that's great to get them dry quick sometimes what we've i see sometimes people trying to dry seed in greenhouses on racks and that can be difficult because there's condensation that builds up on the inside of the plastic at night and then falls back into the greenhouse during the day or in the morning and your seed basically gets wet again so just be mindful like that doing this work means having the particular drying equipment or having some investment in time and space to build some drying equipment. And those can be simple or complicated, but growing the crop and not having the drying situation where most of us go wrong. Growing the seed, but then, oh, what am I gonna do with, how do I dry three pounds of tomato seed? That's where basically the fulfillment of this dream is, where, is what's needed. However you extract it, the, the drying thing is where you need to be. Absolutely. I'd love to, to just to say a couple of comments on what Heron just mentioned about in the greenhouse drying stuff. Um, when we put the tarps that we use to uh, to put stuff on, it's usually landscape fabric that's porous. So it's not gonna pool water. So if there is condensation that falls on, it's gonna drip through, or if just even the plants breathing, it just makes it better ventilation. And then if we have, um, usually stuff gets, you know, things are sitting there and then we extract it in the greenhouse and we'll have bins of seed in it and we have them on shelves, but we have, like we put material over it, like, I don't know, piece, whatever we have lying around over the the, 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 the shelves of seed, not like, not right on top of the container because we want it to, to breathe on the top, but just to keep the condensation from falling down in the greenhouse. Um, and uh, that that's definitely, um, you, you learn quickly that you can <laughs> lose a lot of seed in a short time. Yeah, so I'm just doing a time check. We have three minutes left in the session. Um, and I, I didn't get the impression from your face, Amir, that you were yet ready to talk about the seed drying trailer. <laughs> I I had aimed to have it finished by this conference, but it, I, I haven't actually, um, it's not at a finished state. For, for context, I um, had trouble with my drying shed this past year. So we, we got a, a trailer. Um, made that would act as a as a big like drying uh a big drying area yeah so well but I don't have pictures that's all right we'll say stay tuned that will be information that comes later 
but yeah, it, it's certainly been identified as a need. Well, I'm going to I'm going to pause us from any further discussion so that we actually end on time and be respectful of people's other aspects of their life. Um, but I just really want to thank all of our mentors and speakers for joining us today. And I personally gained a ton from this conversation. I feel like it was super interesting and everybody provided such amazing experiences. So thank you. Thank you for keeping a lively discussion going in the chat. We will save that and, and compile useful resources and try to share that out. Um, and we'll be meeting again tomorrow. Um, those of you that are enrolled in the SEED course will send out another email to you with the links for tomorrow, just so they're easy to find, but you can also find them directly through the conference website. Um, and those of you that joined us for today and are not involved in the SEED project, it's really awesome to have you here. Uh, it's been great. Um, any last words from any of our mentors and speakers? Should we say goodbye for now? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll stay on. There's a couple of questions about the seed course that are coming in. We'll stay on for just a second and touch those. But um, thanks, everybody. Uh, I think this is the end of the official uh, educational portion. And we'll see you tomorrow. Did a really good job, Crystal. <laughs> oh, everybody did a really good job. My job is easy. You guys are doing amazing. Now I thought that was great. You keep us all on time. So thank you for that. <laughs> doing my best. Yep, yep. As one of those speakers that can go on and on. It's nice to be on the other side of it. Just trying to keep it on time. No, just me. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna um I'm I'm gonna sign off. I'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks, Angie. That was great. Okay. It was Thanks, I Angie. loved everybody's presentations. Yeah. And their enthusiasm. It's great. Right? Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing your vast amount of knowledge. <laughs> I'm so excited. Likewise. About the Likewise. I just can't wait. Oh, and and Dan, I have to say your pictures are like the where I want to graduate to with our little caterpillar kind of experiment. <laughs> like, oh, it's all grown up. <laughs> It's really fun to be in a, a panel with people as opposed to being a so, as a piece opposed to being a solo presenter to be able to hear everybody's experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is nice, isn't it? It's definitely fun that way. Yeah, definitely. Oh, thank you, Natasha, for getting that in there. <laughs>